evening, everyone. I would just like to thank you all for coming out tonight. And I would like to start off with a bit of good news because things are, a lot of things are very difficult right now. So as all of you know, Justice Ginsburg fell earlier this month and suffered three fractured ribs. She was back on the bench yesterday in time for the first oral arguments. And Jane, as you point out in your book, Justice Ginsburg has yet to miss a single day of oral arguments since joining the court in 1993, and she's gone through a lot. This is not the first time that she broke her ribs. No. This is a very strong woman. <laughs> yes, and she's uh, been through two cancer um, bouts, the first one of which I think was much the worse in terms of all the chemotherapy and everything that followed. In fact, she was so tiny and so thin when it was over, her husband Marty said to her, you look like a survivor of Auschwitz. Get yourself a trainer. Oh, wow. And that's how she started working out with her current trainer. And as any of you who saw the Colbert show know, she really does quite strenuous exercises. She can hold a plank for how long? I don't remember. A few minutes, at least. <laughs> well, there's actually a book about yes, Ruth Bader Ginsburg I, and exercise. When uh, I did a talk at the Harvard Bookstore, I was browsing around beforehand, and uh, I saw this little book that her trainer has done. <laughs> she says now he's the most important man in her life. <laughs> well. Hopefully you will all get a chance to read this book and maybe even give it, give it away for gifts. This is an amazing book. It is Thank you. a long book. This book is 546 pages of text, uh, 111 pages of end notes. Yes, you can le leave out the last 100 <laughs> pages. Though some of them were actually, well, authors I suppose would say that, historians would. Some of them were sort of revealing. You spent 15 years on this book. Well, living in California, I had an interruption, of a wildfire in which my house burned down, and I lost all my material uh, for the book. So that partially accounts for it. And the other thing is that I had an editor who kept saying, you have to cover the next term. You have to cover the next term. <laughs> and finally, I, her, her name was Vicki Wilson, and I said, Vicki, Ginsburg is going to outlast me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she was a marvelous editor, and she wanted to see sort of the full arc of Ginsburg's life. Why did you decide to embark on such a massive project? And when you started off, did you ever think that this book would be so long, 546 pages of text? I never even intended to write a biography. Um, I, was, I had done a book on um, what was a two-prong strategy devised by some feminist lawyers in the 1960s in an effort to finally get gender discrimination um, on the table. And I had done this book on the effort to ratify the ERA, and I knew that Ginsburg's litigation strategy was the other prong. And I very naively thought that um, I could learn about that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a lawyer by training, um, so that took some time, too. And uh, the first chapter particularly took time. I, ha I had written the 
chapters on the ACLU, which I initially wanted to know more, the ACLU litigation uh, for women's rights. The ACLU had had a very successful civil rights project in which they worked very closely with the Legal Defense Fund uh, and Thurgood Marshall and Jack Greenberg. Uh, and the head of the National ACLU thought, well, our, our next project ought to be about women's rights. And um, Ruth volunteered to write the brief in the first test case that um, the ACLU undertook. And uh, the court, for the first time in history, on a fairly inconsequential case, uh, ruled that the state of Idaho could uh, statute preferring male um, executors to women was sex-based discrimination. Hmm. You wrote about a number of seminal cases, and we'll talk about some of those tonight. But I also want to ask you about your interactions with Justice Ginsburg. You interviewed her six times between 2000 and 2006, and then again after 2015. And she also gave you access to her legal files from her career as an attorney with the ACLU. You also interviewed members of her family, close members of her family, and some of her friends. What, first off, when was the first time you met Justice Ginsburg? And, and how, was it a formal meeting? Can you explain how that happened? Yes. Um, I just, I, the ACLU's depository for its records is a special library at Princeton University called the Silly Mud, Silly Mud Library. And so, I went in and asked to read the case files for Reed v. Reed, that very first case. And it was fascinating because there was a lot of correspondence in it that involving Ginsburg. And I asked the archivist then, could I see the files of the Women's Rights Project? And they said, we don't have them. And I said, are you sure? And they said, yes, the FBI wanted them several years ago. <laughs> and we don't have them. We assume they are still in New York at the national office. Well, I spent probably a year going back and forth. And I spoke to the... Um, national offices of the ACLU, and they said, well, the current director of the Women's Rights Pro Project is pregnant, and we can't get in touch with her. And I thought, that was a little strange. She couldn't talk on the telephone. <laughs> um, but I, I then turned to Princeton University and talked to the head of the whole library system, and he said, well, we have ACLU records that we haven't yet cataloged. And if you'd like to give us a donation. <laughs> and um, I thought, I didn't say, no, thank you. <laughs> but I did feel totally frustrated. And I have a colleague at... Um, the University of UCSB, who had written a biography of Abe Fortas, Justice Fortas. And I was venting, and she said, why don't you approach Ginsburg herself? And I said, you have, I don't even know how she would respond to a letter from a perfect stranger. And Laura said, well, I have a solution to that. <laughs> 
Ginsburg loves opera, as you probably gathered from the music that was chosen coming in. And the Supreme Court historian, um, whom I knew a bit professionally, goes to the opera with her when her husband Marty is out of town. So, why don't you write a letter to Ginsburg and we'll ask the Supreme Court historian, Mava Marcus, to give it to Ruth. And I said, fine. And then they said, well, when you write the letter, send it with other books you've written. <laughs> send it with your resume, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and I didn't he hear anything. And then I went to the mailbox at the university, and I got this letter with a Supreme Court letter ha head, and it was a copy of a memo she had sent to the president of the ACLU. And it said, let this woman see these papers. <laughs> and they did a search and found out that the Women's Rights Project records had been lost in a move from one building to another in New York. And so then she wrote and said, she was doing this ACLU litigation while she was teaching at Columbia Law School. And she said, I have a file box in storage from Columbia here at the Supreme Court with my copies of the case files. And she said, I'll let you see them. And I had been lucky enough to get a National Endowments uh, Fellowship for the following September. And during that summer, she said, just come to my office and you can have access to the records. And during that summer, I came in September, and during that summer, she had them moved over to the Library of Congress Manuscripts Division. And I thought, oh dear, they're going to want to recatalog them before I see them. But they brought them over the day before I came in boxes from the Supreme Court. They're, the two buildings are very close together. And um, after reading some case files, I called up Mava Marcus, the Supreme Court historian, and I said, I really want to thank you for your intervention. And she said, well, would you like to meet Ginsburg? And I said, well, of course. And she said, well, she, the Ginsburg's come, the Supreme Court has a historical uh, society. And uh, the great African-American historian, John Hope Franklin, um, whom I had known, is going to lecture tonight. And if the Ginsburgs are there, I'll introduce you. We were sitting on one end, the back end of the, of the auditorium where the lecture was given. And we sort of inched over to the front of the other side. And Ginsburg and her husband were talking to Justice Souter. And Mava said, um, sorry for interrupting, but, um, and she introduced me, and I said, I just wanted to thank you personally for providing the papers, and then backed off. I was not about to pro prolong an interruption between two Supreme Court justices. <laughs> conversation of two Supreme Court justices. And there was a room near the auditorium where there were very lavish hors d'oeuvres and drinks. And I went in there and <laughs> John L. Franklin said, Jane, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he was talking to Justice Marshall's widow. And uh, then I helped myself to some shrimp and something else. 
and there was this tug on my jacket, the sleeve of my jacket, and I turned around, and it was Justice Ginsburg. And uh, I was staying with a friend who was a historian at Hopkins, and she and her husband knew the Ginsburgs, and she said, Jane, she doesn't do small talk. And if you're sitting next to her at a dinner party, it's up to you to think of a topic that she might be interested in. And if she is, she'll talk very freely. And then when that topic is exhausted, silence. She does not make small talk. So when she came up, I said, I have been having the best time reading the correspondence between Dearest D'Amica and Ranger Fred. Now, Ginsburg wrote a, uh, an amicus brief for a case that this good old boy, Oklahoma lawyer, who had gone to Harvard, but made great to do about what a good old boy he was and what an anti-feminist he was. And the correspondence was really hilarious because he would make these outrageous remarks and she would zip back as good as she, as good as, you know, dish it right back. And also with incredible instructions about how to write his brief, what he must do, what he must not do. Finally, he said, I feel like an expectant father waiting outside the delivery room for the next big event, <laughs> for the big event. Um, and I said to her when she walked up, I said, I've just had such a good time reading these letters. She said, the last time he was in Washington, we had a beer together. <laughs> now, Ginsburg is a wine drinker, and um, she, or she used to, to um, you know, drink alcohol as well. I don't know whether she still does or not. I doubt it, because she's not as sure-footed. <laughs> as she used to be. And uh, then, of course, somebody came up to talk to her, and she drifted, uh, uh, drift, I drifted off her. And then a little later, I got another tug. <laughs> and this time we talked about the Weisenfeld case. And she said, if, any, if there's anything you want to know, just write to uh, Stephen Weisenfeld. He, she said, you know, this is a case about a, a father whose wife died um, when the baby was delivered. He was a computer specialist, and she was um, getting a PhD to be... Uh, a school administrator, and she died in childbirth, and he couldn't find anybody he was willing to have take care of the baby. And so he wrote a little note in a uh, newspaper, New Jersey newspaper, because he applied, widows could apply not only for Social Security um, compensation for the death of a husband and also for the child. But the Social Security Administration had turned him down and he wrote a little column in a local New, uh, New Jersey uh, um, newspaper and he said, Gloria Steinem, get this, <laughs> and described his plight. Hmm. And a friend of Ginsburg's, who uh, also had taught at the first at the um, Rutgers 
uh, campus at New York, saw that in the paper, and sent it to Ginsburg. And she not only took this very difficult case, because people could not, um, the lower court just judges could not imagine why a man with three de advanced degrees would be willing to stay home and take care of a baby. And they developed a very strong relationship. So I dr she drifted off and the next person came up to talk to her. And then later there was another tug. <laughs> and she said, you know, if you have any questions about these cases, just ask me. And that was her fatal mistake. <laughs> <laughs> What really stood out for you? What, what's one of your most memorable moments when you had time with her? Well, one of the most memorable was that as long as we were talking about the ACLU litigation, she was happy to answer questions. She would occasionally um, send me a law review article or something that was relevant. She could not have been more cooperative. And one fatal day, we, I had an interview about once a year, usually on Friday of Labor Day weekend at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and I said, I called up and, to make an appointment, and I said, this year, could we talk about Brooklyn? and Flatbush. No, <laughs> we don't need to talk about Flatbush. And I said, well, you know, she had asked me very early on to call her Ruth. And I said, well, you know, Ruth, there are articles in which, some of which have your mother dying of cervical cancer, some of the different kind of cancer, and um, they're just, there's conflicting factual information. And I think it's very important to get it straight, which is my ploy. She said, I'll give you half an hour. I'm thinking to myself, yes, I'm flying on my dime <laughs> to Washington for half an hour. But I said, well, that, that would be fine. And she clearly did not want to revisit her, her childhood years in Brooklyn because, I mean, there were good things, but there was also tragedy. Her mother had developed um, breast cancer. Uh, her mother had developed cancer when Ruth was a freshman in high school. And in that era, cancer, people just didn't talk about. Mm. And she went through four years of high school not telling a single friend, a single soul, that her mother was dying of cancer. Mm. And she died two days before Ruth's graduation. Mm. And she just did not want to revisit that. And if I ask a question she didn't want to answer, she'd just pretend not to hear it. <laughs> and I would go back the next year, and in the course of asking other questions, I would ask the question again. And sometimes she would answer it, and sometimes she didn't. And sometimes it took me three years. Well, the first chapter about her childhood is pretty detailed. I, I, was, I have to say, I was really surprised to learn that you spoke with her six times over such a long period of time. Because based on the detail, you must have done so much research. I mean, clearly you did looking at all of the notes. But it's so detailed. And I don't think a lot of people know much about her as a younger person. They don't. They don't, that I've found. And that's one of the things they're really most interested in. Uh, 
I mean, we know more about some of her court cases. And we certainly have a, a sense of Ruth as justice, but not as a little girl growing up in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, her father was... Uh, her father came here from Russia when he was 13. Her mother had been conceived in Poland but was born on the Lower East Side. And her mother was really the formidable influence in that family. Her father was... Um, her father was very kind and gentle, but not the dynamic personality that her mother was. And her mother had lost her older child when Ruth was two, uh, to spinal meningitis. And she was determined that this two-year-old that she had left was going to be the total focus of her energy. And she was formidable. She talked about, uh, she talked about women she admired and particularly women of valor, um, women who were Jewish and American and who were activists. And she talked about Emma Lazarus, she talked about Lillian Wall, um, who had a settlement house and um, took care of immigrants on the uh, lo Lower East Side. Uh, she talked about um, a number of Jewish women whose actions she really admired. And she was also a great admirer of Eleanor Roosevelt. And she would read her column, My Day, and she would talk about how Mrs. Roosevelt used her position to speak for the dispossessed, the people, ordinary people, minorities, um, and Celia really admired that. And I often think about that in connection with Notorious R.E.G., <laughs> which was the product of a first-year law student who heard uh, Ginsburg's dissent in the voting rights case mm -hmm. and did this Tumblr, uh, which Ruth had never heard of, and, and her <laughs> clerks told her about it. And she looked at it and was asked, well, you know, what did you and did you and uh, the notorious B.I.G. have anything in common? And she would say, yes, we're both born in Brooklyn. <laughs> What was it like for you, because this is a 15-year project, as you were writing this book, she became a major icon in this country. I mean, this year there are two movies out about her, one documentary, one feature film, The Notorious RBG, The Exercise Book, um, Going on Colbert, and I mean, most justices, they don't allow they, cameras into the gym, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, it's really inter it's really a sort of phenomenon because justices normally lead fairly private lives. I mean, I mean we knew a good deal about Justice Douglas, um, but they aren't um, they aren't celebrities, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of it I think a lot of it had to do with the times in recent years. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that millennial, there's just this huge parfait, array of paraphernalia on the web. You can, I encountered it, I was giving a lecture at Cornell at the law school and um, 
this young man rushed up to me and he had a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I don't know whether it was a real tattoo or not, on his, <laughs> or the face went on his thumb. And he said, I love Ginsburg, but I can't come to your talk because the senior class is having its picture made. I mean, the 30 class is having its picture made. And I thought, well, this is interesting. But I think they really, one of these slogans uh, that you can, that millennials love, is Ruth is truth. And <laughs> I think they, I think they, I think what people respond to is her sense of integrity. Mm. And increasingly in her descents, her ability to, her descents on the Rehnquist court were um, not particularly, I mean, she descended when she felt she needed to, but they aren't, there's nothing memorable about them. But with the Roberts, and I can talk more about that, the difference between Ginsburg on the Rehnquist court mm -hmm. and on the Roberts court, and the power, the increasing power of her descents, and the, and the sense in which she became a phrase maker uh, on the voting rights descent. She likened um, the majority's decision to eliminate a critical provision of the voting rights out to throwing out, out your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm. When the, that year, uh, during that term, that same year, the court had heard, um, I guess it was the Windsor case on same-sex marriage. And during oral argument, this is when the, the justices get to question various, the, the lawyers who are arguing the cases. And um, a lawyer who was arguing said, well, you know, there's no reason why gays and lesbians can't have uh, um, what's the phrase? Um, y uh, unions that are same-sex unions? C civil unions? Civil unions. Why they can't have a civil union. And she said, oh, that's like a skim milk marriage <laughs> instead of a full milk. And the New York Times, on the front page, had quotes from several of the justices. Skim milk marriage. <laughs> now, this throwing away your umbrella, um, in the rain, skim milk marriages, these are phrases that go viral. Mm. And I think that accounts for part of her, uh, uh, her notoriety. Plus the fact that the dissents became more frequent, more pointed, um, and aimed not for the to convince the majority, because she knew they wouldn't. But for both posterity and in the Ledbetter case to uh, get Congress to change the law. And also to spark public dialogue about the issue. I had forgotten, and I'm glad that you reminded us about this in your book. So Ginsburg joined the court in 1993, and leading feminist groups, many, opposed her nomination because of her criticisms of Roe v. Wade. She said that it was way too broad. Way too broad. She would have, um, she claimed, she would have preferred She's a gradualist who believes that you don't make 
changes in the law. You do it incrementally. And in her ACLU litigation, she modeled it on Thurgood Marshall. You take innocuous cases, get a precedent established, build on that precedent to get up to Brown Board of Education, and then it almost seems automatic, though it's anything but. Hmm. And she really believes that the law was to be wooed, a saying of Cardozo, that, that, that law is to be wooed. You know, you make gradual changes. And she thought that the most egregious abortion ban was the Texas case, rather than a Georgia case um, in which Georgia had modified its strict bans. Um, it had a reform law, but it still made it almost it's made it extremely difficult to get abortions. So there were these two cases. And Ginsburg would have preferred striking down the Texas law, which was quite, quite extreme, and then giving, now I don't agree with her on this, but giving states longer to sort of get used to the idea. She thinks it would have averted some of the backlash. Mm. I, I don't, and a, a number of historians don't agree with that. Mm. But, and I also think that you have to remember when that Madison lecture was given. Now this sounds somewhat cynical, but it was a signal as well to the role justices should play. And it, it's interesting, Clinton uh, did not agree with her analysis of um, that she gave in the Madison lecture about Roe. But after talking to her, he was absolutely convinced of, you know, that so wholeheartedly she supported it. She actually thought it should have been anchored, however, in the equal protection. And in her Carhartt dissent, this was a, a law that was passed forbid uh, anti-abortion is um, objected to a particular procedure that was used in late-term abortions. And Congress, Republican Congress, had passed this law. Uh, and it took an, did not take into account the mother's, the, the pregnant woman's life and what medical procedure would be best for her as an individual. And in a really stinging dissent, Ginsburg um, did ground Roe very eloquently in equal protection. But of course, it hasn't, uh, the court has not followed through on that. Let's spend a little bit of time just talking about her experiences that shaped her views on women's rights and equality. You have so many amazing stories in the book about what she and so many women had to deal with when she was in college, for example, at Cornell, when she went to Harvard Law School. She was only, let's see, one of nine women out of 552 students in her Harvard Law School class of 1959. And the dean asked each of those nine women at a welcoming party why they were taking a place that could have gone to a man. Exactly. And Ginsburg was really flustered at that event because a quite, a, a, not, a, women were invited and 
visiting faculty. And she was seated next to a Columbia Law professor who had played a major role in the Nuremberg trial. And <laughs> she uh, was first concerned about um, what she could possibly talk to him about. He was her dinner partner. And she smoked at that time. And when she, and the dean asked each woman to stand up. And when she stood up, her ashtray fell over. And she was so mortified about all the ashes on the floor that she said the most banal thing you could possibly imagine. She said, I wanted to, to understand what my husband did so we would have something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, everybody else who was asked that question took it as a rather sexist action on the dean's part. And um, she prefers she prefers his later interpretation, which was that he needed to respond to some of the Harvard faculty who still thought women shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of what we would now call sexual harassment mm -hmm. at the law school. Mm -hmm. I also loved learning that in the early 1970s, she read Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, while preparing to teach a class on women and, and the law. And you have some great quotes from Ruth's, Rutger's friend and colleague, Eva Hanks, who said, there was a passion that suddenly gripped her. I remember her telling me that she was so affected by that book that she crawled into bed with Jane and read parts of it aloud. Jane was her daughter. Her daughter. In fact, she was so excited and talked to lots of colleagues about the book. She sort of caught fire. She found her goal or passion starting with that book. Even the men in the department noticed the change in Ruth. It was unmistakable. It's amazing how w what one book could have such a profound effect. Well, she wasn't that much impressed with Betty Friedan's book. <laughs> she thought it, it um, I mean, she read it. She thought it was, spoke to a problem, but she thought it was a very that it was addressed to a certain group of women who was not very inclusive. Mm. And also, she had never been tempted to be a stay-at-home mom. And that was a decision she made. Um, Marty was a year ahead of her in, at Harvard Law School. And he developed testicular cancer, her his last year and her second year. And it was very life-threatening. Uh, he had multiple surgeries and they were told afterwards they couldn't have any more children, though they did many years later have a son. And she took very seriously the fact that she might well have to be the so a single parent. And she also felt that her mother would have been much happier had she been able to keep her job hmm. and uh, not, her mother had been an accountant uh, earlier. But this was the 50s. Hmm. And, you know, it was, um, and de, Bois, de Beauvoir really, it was that click. We're going to take questions in a couple minutes, so if you have any, please get them ready. Let's talk about just how things have changed so much over the decades. Because when the feminist groups opposed her nomination, she was really hailed as a centrist, 
by conservatives and liberals. She was confirmed by a nearly unanimous margin, which unfortunately is unheard of today. <laughs> we know why that is. But let's just talk about how the court has changed and how he, she has changed with it. You write that uh, the, a fourth theme is the growing conservatism of the high court over the past five decades and the changing meanings attached to familiar labels. That Ginsburg, a centrist judge on the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit from 1980 to 1993, is today ranked, along with Justice Sonia Sotomayor, as the most liberal member of the court is telling. At a fundamental level, Ginsburg's distinctive jurisprudence has changed little. The court, however, has changed, which also explains by some of her most notable opinions in recent years have taken the form of dissent. So can you talk just about how the court has changed and how she's changed with it? Can I back up Please. Just, just a minute? Um, Ginsburg almost didn't get a judgeship after the omnibus judgeship bill passed because people in the Carter administration consider her to be too liberal. I mean, here, here was a woman who had been an ACLU um, head of women's rights project. And that did not fit the image of a corporation lawyer from whom judges were usually appointed. And of course it didn't because uh, women of minorities didn't get those corporate jobs then. Um, and she really had a perils of Pauline uh, journey on her road to uh, the DC circuit. And I talked to um, Patricia Wald, who was the first woman ahead of Ruth to be appointed to the circuit. And I said, um, she was a public interest lawyer, but she said in her words, I had been sanitized because I had been in the Justice Department, the Carter administration, and my job was liaison with Congress. So there were people on the Hill who knew me, and I had some credibility. So I think the agonizing weight of seeing these other people being appointed before she was, and of being knowing she was considered too liberal, um, to use Pat Wall's phrase, when she got on the court, she was a moderate. Uh, she loves challenging wits with conservatives. Uh, it's what, one reason she and Scalia were such good friends. and. Uh, she was on the court with uh, Scalia and with, um, oh, the law professor who was turned down for the, Bork. Uh, and she, there were t times when she did not vote with her fellow, many times when she did not vote with her fellow liberals on the DC circuit. And I think that was, I think she is basically a liberal leaning moderate. Uh, but her 13 years on the DC circuit, which in which she was pretty removed from the public and certainly from active feminist organizations, uh, left her with a reputation of being a judge's judge, very fair, very knowledgeable, but a centrist. Um, and so there are people who ask with all these dissents, is this Ruth's inner liberal coming out? And she would say, no, 
I was always an incrementalist, but the court has gotten so conservative. Mm -hmm. And Stevens, who was upon, uh, uh, Justice Stevens, who was reported by a Republican, who had always been a Republican, thought the court got so conservative that he ended up as the leading liberal uh, before his retirement. Hmm. And it's gotten more conservative with each consecutive appointment. We were talking beforehand about how, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but after this last fall, people said that we need to put her in bubble wrap so if she falls again, she can just bounce right back, back up. But there's, I would love to know, I mean, you talked to her after 2015. Were you able to talk at all about the pressure to stay healthy? Because, I mean, I hate to say this, but there's a likelihood that the man in the White House could win again. And we're talking about six more years, right? I mean, there must be so much pressure on her to I'm stay sure, healthy. Well, as she said, my trainer, Right. It's the most important man in my life now. And I think that's her acknowledgement of that. But you know, she really, in, in a strange way, as tiny and as frail as she is, and she has a, a neck injury that causes her, when you see pictures of her, to have her head sort of bowed like this. And I had an interview with her uh, after her husband died, and um, it was at her apartment in the Watergate. And when I walked in, she had this neck brace on, and I said, oh, you've taken to wearing Elizabethan collars. <laughs> and she explained what it was. I don't get a sense from looking at photographs that it did much good. Hmm. But she's just really indestructible hmm. at one level. And she is, has never missed an oral argument. It's amazing. Let's open the floor to questions. While we get ready, I'll ask you another question. Uh, you write that Justice Ginsburg, well, you write a lot about the cases that she was involved with. I mean, when she had, when she, she played such a role, a, a crucial role in so many cases, were there any cases that you maybe didn't know much about that you think the public should know more about? Because we hear a lot about Casey and some of the other very obviously important cases, but what about the ones that don't get that much attention? Well, there's a case, um, one of the cases that she's particularly fond of was a case of a Mississippi woman and the case is known by initials, who was divorced and her husband remarried and wanted the children. And she did not have the money to get the necessary documents to, I think it was something like 200, around $250, to get the documents that she needed to challenge him on custody. And Ginsburg is very much concerned about access to the courts. Mm -hmm. And this is a case, this is a case all about access for people who are impoverished. Mm -hmm. You can get it in a criminal case, but this was a civil case. And she's very proud of that case. She's also very proud of uh, Virginia, uh, U.S. versus Virginia, which was a case about uh, enrolling, forcing 
Virginia Military Institute to accept women. And that's an interesting case because she wrote 13 versions of the opinion in order to get one that satisfied Justice Kennedy. And you, you see her, the process of, justices, believe it or not, don't really talk to each, I mean, they have lunch with each other when the court is in session, but they can't, they can only talk about sports, cultural events, and um, what new play or museum uh, exhibit there is. They can't talk about cases. And in the days when Thurgood Marshall and Brennan used to have a well-worn path between each other's offices, is the day past. The judges communicate with, uh, once a vote is taken on a case, and the case is assigned to someone to write the opinion, then the draft starts circulating. And the justice was Justice X will say to Justice Y, "Well, if you insert such, such, such and such, or if you modify this, if you modify that, I'll be happy to join on your opinion." And it's that process which was so well illustrated in that case of which she was very proud because it was sort of the apex of her ACLU litigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote the opinion, and she wrote it because Rehnquist had asked uh, Sandra Day O'Connor to write it, and she said, no, this should be Ginsburg, because it's full of all these precedents. Mm -hmm she created, and the negotiations that went into those 13 drafts, I thought was a very telling example of how the court works. Mm. Questions from the audience? I can't see. So I have a question to your left. Yes, uh, it said that uh, Justice Ginsburg won five of six cases with the ACLU. Um, the one case that she lost, is that Frontiero? And no, no it, was a, it was a Florida case of um, reverse discrimination. And this was a, a law that gave a very small compensation, tax compensation, to widows, indigent widows, but not to widowers. And the Florida ACLU, the, AC, the state ACLUs are never supposed to appeal a case without the permission of the national ACLU. And this case was appealed and the ACLU thought, my God, this is the last thing we need, a reverse discrimination case, before we've barely gotten started. And Ginsburg, there's some really funny letters that she wrote in which she said, can anybody, I've forgotten what she offered, to anybody who could tell her how to argue this case on anything other than equal protection. She really struggled over the brief, but in the process, she convinced herself that she could, after Frontiero, that she could possibly win it. And she counted on Justice but Douglas's vote. And Douglas, who walked out of the oral argument um, before she finished, 
But she, it never occurred to her she said, that she wouldn't get his vote. And he, and he instructed his clerk um, to do the draft. He wasn't interested in it. And so there is an interview with the clerk who <laughs> expresses some befuddlement about this, but wrote, a, uh, wrote an opinion. And it wasn't till later that a law school student wrote to her. I mean, she was just appalled that Douglas didn't buy her argument after he had bought all the others. And this law school student, I think, was at, maybe at Emory, and she said, you should read Douglas's, Justice Douglas's biography because his father died, the family was extremely poor, and there was no way he was going to, he was going to vote for that case because of that because the children in the Douglas family worked, they scrimped, they really had a very rough childhood. And there was no way he was gonna make this Florida uh, small amount of money that went to widows. He was gonna make that, uh, he was going to make that based on uh, widowers that were similarly situated. That is, that the pension could have gone to needy widowers and not just to widows. There was no way he was gonna make that gender neutral. Thank but you. she thought it set a terrible precedent for her later litigation that she had to overcome. There's but much, that, was a, that there's, was a case she lost. Thank you. There's much said about scrutiny in Frontiero particularly. She feels that, that she lost on that particular point. Could you explain that? Yes. Um, first of all, let me explain a little bit about scrutiny, level of scrutiny. There were two kinds initially. Um, rational basis, that is, if state passed a law, and if it had any rational basis for that law, and good attorneys could certainly come up with one, um, it got rat for sex discrimination, let's say, or racial discrimination. It did not, was not subject to rigorous scrutiny or strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny was what was used in uh, race discrimination cases. That is, the justices had to take a very hard look at it. And when Ginsburg argued this first innocuous case, Reed v. Reed, she, her, her, her goal was to introduce, not just to win the case, but to introduce the idea of strict or rigorous, very rigorous scrutiny on sex-based discrimination. Um, which was also applied to race-based discrimination. And she kept winning these cases, and it was clear to many of the members of the court that they were indeed looking at sex-based discrimination much more hard, much more rigorously than had been the case in the past. But there were other more conservative justices on the court who thought applying strict scrutiny or rigorous scrutiny to, they just couldn't imagine um, 
gender neutral cases. I mean, they, they just didn't think men and women were fungible. And finally, in a totally different case, I think it was Blackman who said, um, in effect, maybe we could have something in between. And so Ginsburg took this, what she called her frothy beer case, which was um, a case in which Oklahoma uh, allowed women to drink near beer <laughs> at a younger age than men. And Kinsberg knew it was a frothy case, as she referred to it. But she thought this was her chance to get what became known as intermediate scrutiny. That is, it was more, supposed to be more serious than, than a rational uh, base test, but not as searching as strict scrutiny. And in fact, strict scrutiny ultimately became no longer a goal, because, but because it was used against affirmative action. We and so in the, v, in the VMI case, she called for, I think the phrase was rigorous scrutiny. Uh, we have another question here in the center. We have time for two more questions, and then I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, Jane will be signing books afterwards in the lobby. Yeah, um, Merrick Garland aside, and um, given her formidable fortitude to date, is, does she have any regret for not stepping down while Obama was still president and That's could have very moved? That's a very good question. And I think I can explain why she didn't. Now, whether she was right in her thinking, I guess history will prove. But she felt that Sandra Day O'Connor, if you recall, Sandra Day O'Connor's husband developed Alzheimer's. And um, she was trying to bring him to her chambers because somebody had to keep an eye on him. And he got to the point where he'd wander off. And she felt that he had reached a stage where she needed to step down so she could spend, devote more time to him. And then, of course, I don't know whether you remember this or not, but then his disease advanced very rapidly, so that in just a year or so, he no longer recognized her and found another woman in this home that he was, thought he was in love with. And O'Connor really regretted, in hindsight, having what in effect was prematurely resigning. So she was very much a negative. She was, that's what Ruth wanted to avoid. And she also, and this was in Obama's um, first two years, and she also thought she loves the job. She'd certainly rather win than lose, but she really loves this job. And I don't think at that point she, like I've, like so many people, thought Clinton would, uh, Hillary Clinton would win. Mm -hmm. And there would, would have been a certain symmetry since Bill Clinton appointed her to the court huh. for Hillary Clinton to replace her, uh, you know, to choose her replacement. And I, 
I just don't think at the time it ever occurred to her that she might be in a situation when this would prove to have been the wrong decision. And we don't know yet. I mean, her argument up to this point has been is that she'll know when it's time to go and that she gets her opinions done before everybody else on the court. She's very frail looking, but she is very sharp um, in conversation. I mean, she looks like a stiff wind could blow her away. <laughs> and she clearly is not quite as steady on her feet. I, she, she's a great opera fan, as you know. And um, she, was, she loves the Santa Fe Opera. And two years ago, um, she was at the opera. It's, it's very interesting to watch. We happened to be at that same opera because I had asked her for an interview in Washington on my usual Labor Day weekend. And she said, well, I'm not going to be in Washington. I'm going to, I'm going to perform a wedding. So why don't you come to Santa Fe? So my husband and I went to Santa Fe, and it's a, and as many of you know who have gone to Santa Fe, they often um, you can hear a lecture about the opera beforehand, and some of the lectures are very good. Um, if you sign up for dinner on the patio. And you never know, unless I guess you're an old timer, where you're going to be placed at what table. And we were at a table here, and Ruth and her family were at a table closer than that stage door. And it was quite interesting to observe because when they arrived, there was for the, the terrace for dinner, there was spontaneous applause. <laughs> and she is always escorted to, she and her party are always escorted to their seats. And again, there's a little scattering of applause. And the next day, she, the, um, younger singers in the opera were doing a performance at a theater in, in Santa Barbara. And Ginsburg loves to do a law and opera speech. And so all these arias were introduced by her of these younger singers. And she is extremely versed, not only in the law, but in opera history. So her example of plea bargaining, <laughs> the first uh, plea bargaining in, in opera was in um, Carmen when she's, Carmen is persuading the lieutenant who, or the soldier who uh, imprisoned her to let her go. But she did very, some that were much more subtle. And it was interesting because if she stands up to go to the podium, she likes to have a chair very nearby, so she can sort of have one chair on the air, uh, one arm on the ch her armchair, and get up to the po uh, podium. But she is so 
was so, I mean, it was just a wonderful performance. Her introductions, and most of them were much more subtle than plea bargaining and, and Carmen. Jane, we do have time for actually one more question, and it's here off to your left. We've heard a lot over the years about Ginsburg's friendship with Antonin Scalia. Can you tell us anything that you learned uh, about her connections to the other female Supreme Court justices, Kagan, Sotomayor, or even Sandra Day O'Connor? Well, she was extremely close to and somewhat deferential to O'Connor. Um, O'Connor was her big sister when she came on the court, and... Um, she also knew that O'Connor had been the one person who had, um, who she could count on as an ally on cases involving women's rights. Scalia, <laughs> I went to an unveiling of her portrait at the Supreme Court and it was in an arena like this with the Supreme Court justices at the D.C. Circuit Court, of the D.C. Court of Appeals. And the court of the D.C. Circuit in robes was up here. Um, Ginsburg's clerks over the years were in the first part of the audience. And there were some tributes. And the first tribute, the first person paid tribute was Scalia. And he got up and said, now I'm the last person you would, you would suspect paying tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and she's never gonna make a feminist out of me. <laughs> and we never convince each other on uh, and, uh, seldom convince each other in terms of how we vote. Then he proceeds to pay her enormous tribute. And one of the, th they both had, a, they both shared a love of writing and getting the right word. Now, this goes back for Ruth to studying literature under um, Nabokov at Cornell. And he placed great emphasis on words and word order. So actually, when Scalia, in the VMI case, in which Scalia was the only vote. Thomas could not vote because his son was at VMI. He had to recuse himself. In that case, Scalia was the only person who vehemently dissented. Now, what is interesting is that he gave his dissent to Ginsburg. She said, it ruined my weekend <laughs> because I had to try to you know, uh, anticipate arguments that he was going to raise and take, try to answer them in my opinion. But she would do the same for him. She would say, wouldn't your opinion or wouldn't your dissent be stronger if you phrased such and such differently? So they shared this love of writing and, and his humor just cracked her up. I, uh, I think everybody on the court said after his death, it really is a paler place. He was extremely witty, and the justices can, when it, during an oral argument, if you're sitting in the right seat, you can hear them speaking sort of sort of voce to each other. And Scalia would crack these jokes and she said, 
I would have to pinch myself to keep from laughing out loud. <laughs> and I actually had bruises on my arms. <laughs> so um, I think they, and they love to match wits. They, Rinquist just felt like stringing both of them up by their necks because he was very, very prompt. And when the court would meet after an oral argument for conference, Rehnquist was extremely punctual. And in the last minute or two, Scalia and Ruth would come in, talking away, and make them about at least two minutes late. Um, they were really shared a zest for living, too. I mean, the mo one of the most brutal cases was uh, uh, Bush v. Gore. Mm. And when people asked Scalia about it later, he would say, oh, get over it. Oh. And he and Ruth had issued a very scathing dissent of a, position, of a position that he and some of the other conservatives had taken. And he called her up after this very long, arduous night. And he didn't say, get over it. He said, go take a hot bath. <laughs> he sent her roses on her birthday. He referred to them as the odd couple. But I don't see that friendship replicated. I mean, she clearly, she, uh, the minority, uh, Breyer, uh, uh, Sotomayor, and Kagan are obviously very compatible. But I don't see any other example of this sort of odd couple friendship mm -hmm. on well, the court. Well, we're out of time, and you want to sign books, but I have one more question, and if you can be very brief. Um, just because, Jane, I mean, you have dedicated your life to writing about women's history and U.S. history, and you've done so many amazing things. You wrote a book about the ERA. You wrote another book called Women's America, Refocusing the Past. Before we started, I asked Jane, as I always do with these amazing women on whose shoulders my generation stands, it's shocking to think that we're talking about birth control again in the year 2018. I mean, these are very dark times and troubled times. Where do you find hope right now? And for those who are active, what do you think is most effective? Sorry to say brief, but I'd like to get you to sign books. I th I'll answer this very briefly. I think our hope is with a younger generation and an older generation who, realize, who realizes how the gains we thought we had won in the 70s and the 60s are going down have gone down the drain. Well, thank you, Jane. That's a dismal note to end on. <laughs> thank you so much. And I think Ginsburg would tell you what she tells younger people. Find a cause you care about and do something about it. <laughs> <laughs>